On behalf of Wayne State University and the Department of Accounting and the School of Business, we'd like to welcome you to the 23rd annual George R. Husband Distinguished Lecture Series. I'll take about two minutes to talk a little bit about George Husband and then we'll introduce our speaker. George Husband was quite a man, a man who died in 1958. Forty years after he became, he died, some of his alumni, friends, and students contributed enough money to endow a professorship, a lecture series, and a scholarship in George Husband's honor. And obviously the greatest honor in my life, my professional life, is being the husband professor at Wayne State University. I've said this many times. Forty years after George Husband died, they endowed a professorship. Forty years after, forty minutes after I'm no longer on the scene, they'll say, Alan who? Now, George Husband was a leader in three or four very important categories, very briefly. A phenomenal teacher. I've met in my career at least 200 people that over the years when he was a professor who changed their lives. Phenomenal researcher, a man who's been dead for 50 years is still number 10 in the all-time hits in the Academy Review of the Best Journal in Accounting. A phenomenal man in service. He was vice president of education and president of the American Accounting Association. Research thinks he was a student of William A. Payton. 12 out of 10 accounting professors in this country will say that William A. Payton was the father of accounting. He certainly was. The University of Michigan's accounting program is under the William A. Payton School. William A. Payton had the fortune to live to be 100 years old and had a 100th birthday party, like a living wake. People asked him who was the best student he ever had, and he said it was George, our husband. That's quite a compliment coming from William A. Payton. But to me, it's very important what George Hus Husband did in his character. In the 1950s, when the CPA firms were not hiring people of color, Jews, or women, he was asked when his department chair to send them his best student. He sent them a Jewish student. The firm called them back and said, George, old buddy, old pal, we don't hire Jewish students. And he said, you are my best student. If you don't hire my Jewish students, you're not going to hire my Christian students either. And that one courageous act changed and opened doors for all people in the state, something I remember for the rest of my life. I want to not talk about our speaker. A couple of things that are very interesting about our speaker. I can do some math, and the math to me is four-year undergraduate, three-year uh, law degree, and two-year MBA, two of those three with high distinction, equals nine years. He was able to get all three from the University of Michigan and Ann Arbor by the age of 23. I mean, it's, I can't imagine he did it. He was a partner in the firm of Coopers and Librand, now part of PricewaterhouseCoopers. It only takes 12 years to become a partner, maybe one in 15 and one in 20 made it. He did it in six years. I can't even imagine the math of how this person did it. He's only the third person in the United States of America to become a CPA, then become a governor. The governor, Richard Lamb, did it in Colorado, and Chris Del Sesto did it in Rhode Island in the 1950s. He's a man of enormous accomplishments, a man who founded a, uh, and led a gateway computer to become a Fortune 500 company, a man who has all the energy in the world, and the man who's so family conscious he's going to rather commute from Ann Arbor to Lansing to be with his family so his kids can come home. A man of the highest respect, I'd like you all to give a standing ovation to our governor-elect, the Honorable Rick Snyder. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Well, that's a wonderful welcome, and thank you for the wonderful introduction. I'm honored to get the husband lecture today. It's a real opportunity, and it's great to hear the history of George Husband and the wonderful things he accomplished. I was born in 1958, so hopefully I can make a few good things happen following that. So it's good to be with you today. One thing, typically I've never started a talk with a joke, but one of our team members came to me and he said, you got to do this. you got to do this. The team really wants you to do this. Because, again, I'm a CPA, and telling jokes is not my strong suit. But they said, you got to tell the joke. I said, what do you call an old CPA? And the response is, governor. <laughs> so if it's okay, I'll tell them I did okay, but the joke was good. The delivery needed some work. 
But I'm very happy to be with you today, and there are two or three things I'd like to cover with you um, based on the discussion we had with the universities. One is I'd like to give you some personal background about being a CPA and what it's like to be an accountant in the career path, because we've got so many wonderful students here today that are looking forward to that as their career path. And hopefully have, we may have some that are just interested, and hopefully this might be a positive influence on that discussion. Second thing is, is I would like to talk about reinventing Michigan and what needs to be done. And then I'd just like to bring it all together about what it really means to be in accounting and business in government and what are the fundamental drivers and why, what drives me behind all those things. So first of all, let me give some background on being a CPA because I am very proud to be one. Um, actually, you heard the phrase tough nerd during the campaign. I bet everyone knows that one, right? Um, well, the great introduction explained part of that, the degrees, getting three degrees by 23, you're going to get called a nerd no matter what. But to put it in context, actually my interest in doing numbers go way back. I'll tell you a funny story. When I was a child, um, many of you won't remember this. You're too young because now when you go to a restaurant, everyone just punches buttons and the check all comes out and it's all calculated and added. Back when I was a young person, people used to add up their checks. Many of you remember the waiter or the waitress actually doing the numbers and seeing the math when the bill came. Well, I grew up in a family where my mother had the habit of handing me the bill every time saying, you add it up, honey, and make sure it adds. The funny part is, is the hit rate was about 90%. About 10% of the time, I would find an error and talk about embarrassing. Here's about an eight-year-old kid going to someone saying, this doesn't add. But it was a great experience in terms of growing up that way. Um, and I did go off to the University of Michigan early, and I got my bachelor's degree when I was 19 years old. As part of it, though, I studied liberal arts, but I also took enough credits to study for the CPA exam because I viewed that as a great option. And I knew I was getting an MBA, so I studied liberal arts for my first degree. And then I went and got my MBA, and I got that when I was 20. Um, at that point, though, I knew I was going to law school for three years, so I said, let me go sit for the CPA exam. So I got three years. There's no stress here. I can go take, I got three years. They give you credit in parts. I'm just going to go take this exam. And so what happened was I went up to Lansing to take the exam. I'm about as laissez-faire as you get, hadn't done any studying. And I stayed with my aunt because she lived in Lansing. Well, the part I didn't tell you is my uncle who had passed away was one of the name partners of one of the most prominent regional and Michigan-based accounting firms in our state. He actually had a CPA certificate that had less than four digits in the number. He was that early in terms of the profession. And my aunt was very proud of that, and she was so excited I was studying, I was going to take the CPA exam. You know what she did? She went to the phone and called the chair of the Board of Accountancy for the state of Michigan and put me on the phone and asked him to give me a few tips. Now, there's a little stress now, so I thought I was just relaxing. Now I got some pressure to pass this thing. Well, fortunately, it worked out great. I did pass the whole exam. Um, I won't tell you my scores, <laughs> but it worked. And then went off to law school. And in law school, one thing I'd mention is it was a great opportunity because I actually I started teaching then because I didn't have great communication skills. I was a very smart kid, but I didn't have the ability to really speak in front of people. To be blunt, I was terrified. I couldn't give a talk. So one of the ways I thought I could address that was to start teaching, where you'd have a group of students you could do that with. And given my background, they started giving me accounting classes. So the first class I ever taught was actually um, the introductory tax class for undergraduates. And they didn't give me a section. They just gave me a book saying, here, write the whole class. So I wrote this class, and it went really well. Then I did introduction to accounting. And it was just a fabulous experience. But one other experience I wanted to add is when I was also in school, I took a program, I, I participated in a program called VITA. It's the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. And it's about doing tax returns for low income and people that don't know how to do a tax return. It's actually an IRS program where they teach students and other people to go out and help in the community with elderly people, other people that are challenged, just to help do their tax returns for them. And I did it the first year and it went so well. I actually taught the program for about five years after I participated in it. And that's something I would actually encourage any of you that are accounting students or tax students to do. Because it really made a difference. Because literally there are cases, I remember of helping a number of elderly people that really didn't have any income. They were on Medicare. And basically by doing things right, they could get home heating credits, some of these other credits, they could get a couple hundred dollars. 
and to watch the expression on someone's face that was getting a couple hundred dollars that didn't know it was coming or even there, um, that was just fabulous. So there's an opportunity to give back in many respects of what we do. And then I had the opportunity to go to Cooper's and Librand. And one thing I'll tell you, that was an interesting career choice. Because when I had it coming out of school, I, had, I brought, boiled it down to two job offers. And this is in 1982. How many people were around in 1982 in Michigan? Those of you who remember 1982, it was the closest to the terrible times we've had over the last few years. The unemployment rate was actually higher then. The other thing that was taking place, if you were in Detroit, the Houston Post was being brought up by the truckloads to be sold for the want ads for people to take jobs in Texas. So I had two job offers I came down to. One was working in Houston, in Texas, and the other was working in Detroit. And the job in Houston was actually for the most prestigious, one of the most prestigious companies in the world, a high flyer in the energy industry, um, and they offered me a top flight job in their tax law department on a very fast track. The second job offer was to come do public accounting in Detroit. And to put it in perspective, I'm a Battle Creek boy. I'd never even been to a Tiger game. I knew two people in all of Metro Detroit. So it's not like I had any real ties here. But I did want to stay in Michigan for family. It was interesting, too, when I looked at the pay scales. The job in Houston offered me 30% more money. I took the job in Detroit. Well, thank you. <laughs> and the question is, what was the final decision-making factor? What made that huge difference in why I went to work in Detroit? It wasn't about doing accounting. It wasn't about the work. It was about the people I was going to work with. Because the people I was going to work with, the people that were trying to hire me, said they would be my mentor. They would help grow my career and develop my career. And they kept their word, and they were fabulous people. There was a gentleman named Jerry Wolf that actually was part of the process, who's since passed away. John Heitman, Steve Epstein's here from the audit side, that was back in those days. And there were some fabulous people that said they would help you develop your career. And that was more important to me than money or the other things. And you can see it worked. I became a partner in six years. And it wasn't just me. It was because of the team effort and the investment they put in my career. So that's the opportunity you can have. So when you look at your future, don't think about just the money. And don't think about the short term. Think about how you're building that platform for long-term success and who you're going to be over the longer scale and where that can develop and grow into. So my experience at Cooper's was fabulous. And what I'll tell you is people often talk about public accounting. They go, oh, how would you go do public accounting for a couple of years? Well, what I'll tell you is the work, one, I did enjoy the work. But more important than that, what I'll tell you, whether you're on tax or audit and public accounting, the best learning experience was not just learning about numbers. It was the work experience opportunity to have multiple bosses, because you work for different partners all the time, and to go to so many different businesses. Because if you think about it, tax people had it easy. If you're on the audit side, fundamentally, you're asked to go see people that really didn't want to see you. <laughs> And you had to build a positive relationship with them and create a great working relationship and succeed with those people. And I just think that's fabulous people experience, not number experience. Beyond that, I had an opportunity after being at Cooper's for six years or seven years here in Detroit, I became a partner, started doing mergers and acquisition work, helping people buy companies. That worked so well, they actually asked me to transfer to Chicago, where I headed up. I'd built the M&A practice for Cooper's in Chicago which was mainly helping people buy companies. And that was a lot of fun. About every year, I did it for a couple of years, about 50 companies a year I'd have to go look at. Everything from steel foundries to psychiatric hospitals. And the good part is, after I did due diligence on the psychiatric hospital, I got out. <laughs> but what an opportunity to see so many different businesses, so many different business models, the common things and the differences, and what an experienced platform to build on. And that's the way you need to approach it, in terms of looking at career opportunity. And when I was in Chicago, I actually helped a company say, don't buy this company. And what was that company? It was a company called Gateway. They said, we want to buy this notebook computer company. I said, no, don't. Do, do that. Um, after I got to know the founder, Ted Waite, he said, I want you to move out on the prairie. Come join me. And it was interesting when I went and told the, uh, my partners at Cooper's, they said, you're nuts. You're going to move out to this company in South Dakota and go out on the prairie. Because basically at the time, Gateway was a metal building with a gravel parking lot with an alfalfa field around it. 
Uh, my wife also concurred with the partners in saying I'm nuts, so it wasn't exclusive to the partners I was working with. Um, but we made that switch. And what I found very quickly working with Ted is, is um, he's a marketing genius, product genius, but not a manager at first love, and so I ended up running the place. I was in my early 30s. There were about 600 to 100 people or so when I first started. We grew to 13,000 people in six years. And we're a huge success. And that was just an incredible experience. I was sharing with some people at lunch. We did an IPO a couple years after I joined the company. And I can tell you with pride, although I got to look back to say, you're nuts. We actually did an IPO without a CFO. Um, there was me running the operations and a controller. And we were able to take a company public. Um, because we just had that spirit that we weren't going to be beat, that you could do incredible things. And it was a huge success. Um, Gateway was going to move to California in 1997 or so, and it had become a big company. It was a $6 billion organization, a Fortune 500 company, and it wasn't as much fun anymore because building it was the fun, most fun. So with the move to California, we said we were coming back home. So we moved back to Michigan. And what I do then was venture capital. So I've been doing startup companies. Um, I raised a couple hundred million dollars and went out to find professors bright people like on Wayne State's campus to say, let's take an idea and make it a real company for real people. And that's where the accounting and tax background was fabulously valuable in terms of saying, how do you use that skill set to help build a company? Because the famous part I can tell you, if you work on doing startup companies and you have to look at business plans, you'll never find a projection that you didn't like because they're going to make those numbers work one way or another. So you had to learn that skill set of how to ask the right questions to find out what the numbers really could be. Um, because many times I'd see a plan that was going to be a billion dollar company in about five years. But it was a fabulous experience building companies and watching them succeed. One company in particular I'm really proud of is a company called Health Media. And I like to share this story because it shows this isn't just about making money or doing numbers. You have an, an ability to really impact real people's lives both in terms of creating jobs, but making the world a better place. So Health Media was a company, I met a professor, Vic Strecker, one day. Went in his office, um, listened to his technology. I got so excited, he got so excited, we got on his whiteboard right there and outlined a business plan. At the end of that meeting, we did a handshake deal that created the company. That company today employs almost 200 people. It was acquired by J&J &J a couple years ago. In addition to employing a lot of people, a dozen years later, what does it do? It's the world's leader in wellness and disease management using tailored tools on the internet. It's helping keep people healthy. It's being used all around the world. It's making a difference. So that's the kind of results you can get when you have the right background. So those are all great opportunities. Now let me talk about Michigan. Because again, I think I have had a pretty fabulous career in the private sector. I've enjoyed it tremendously. So one of the questions I first got when I started running is, why would you want to be governor of Michigan? Well, I'm proud to say I want the job. And fortunately, I've earned it at this point. And I'm ready to go to work. Um, and the reason I wanted to be governor of Michigan is we've got a suffering state. We've got a state with a broken economy and a broken government. And there's a better answer. We need to change our culture in the state that also contributes to this problem. And why do I bring that up before I talk about those other problems? And I'm not going to spend time talking about blame or those kind of issues. Is we've been beaten up for so many years, we've gotten too negative on ourselves. We've become too down on ourselves, too hard, and too divisive. And we've gotten in this model of fighting about things too much, whether it be partisanship or geography or racial or ethnic issues. So one reason I want to run because it's time to solve problems. It's time to stop fighting. It's time to simply say as Michiganders, we can win together and be positive. Thank you. And I think that's a great opportunity and it's time. It's been long overdue, but we're gonna make it happen now. So it's about bringing us together. And the format I campaigned on is very simple. We need a vision for the state. We know we're a mess, but where's that bright spot out in the future that we're going to be a great state again? And so I came up with a vision. I call it the era of innovation. It's time for a new era in our state to focus on innovation again, and entrepreneurship and those great things. 
It's about having great urban areas, about making Detroit a great city again. Thank you. And one of the keys to making Detroit a great city again is leveraging great institutions like Wayne State. In particular, one of the things more important than just the institution are you the young people that are here. One of the core goals of this era is to say we've got to create an environment where our young people not only want to stay, but can stay and have a family and a career. That's the Michigan we're going to have in the future. We are going to make this happen. So that's the vision. Second step is you need a plan. And again, being a good accountant, I came up with 10 points, right? Had to be a good round number. So we've got a 10-point plan to make that happen that really focuses on more and better jobs. Again, I'm not going to go into all those kind of points. You're going to hear about them January 1 and beyond, believe me, because we are going to hit the ground running hard to make those things happen. But the last part is also important, taking action. It's time to stop talking to start doing. That's been one of the most frustrating experiences I'll just share with you personally, was during the campaign trail, and actually this transition phase, is chomping at the bit to actually make more action happen. It is time to move forward, and we're only less than a month away. So get that countdown clock going to take action. And again, I'll come back to this thing about solving problems. And why do I want to talk about solving problems for a couple minutes? How do you solve problems? It's something we don't talk about enough. Well, one of the ways people have different styles, I'm going to share with you my decision-making style on how you solve a problem. And that's how we're going to approach it at the state level, I hope. It's first, you start with the facts. Because in many respects, we don't have the facts out to all of us. And this brings back into the accounting background and all that skill set. One of the first things I've asked for is a set of financial statements in plain language for the average citizen. Now that sounds exciting, right? I know you're all looking forward to reading them. <laughs> but if you want to start the dialogue the right way, we have to set the groundwork the right way. Because if I ask people in this audience, how many of you actually understand the financial statements of the state of Michigan? I doubt, well, we got some accounting faculty here. We may get a couple hands going up. But other than that, no one does. It's actually published in a public, it's called the CAFR, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Um, there should be a warning label, and I can say this because I am a CPA, there should be a warning label saying not made for human consumption <laughs> on this document. And so one of the most critical things I want to do is get a plain language set of financial statements to all of us. Because that will be an eye-opening experience. But it's getting the facts to all of us to understand we've spent beyond our means. And how are we going to address those questions? And when I say I'm asking it for the state, we're going to do it in a fashion where we're going to ask every jurisdiction in the state to do that. Every school district, every municipality, every organization that has bonds out there. So you can see the numbers. Because that's the start of the solution, being honest about what the situation is. But we're not going to stop there. Then we're going to move forward. And the next big step is something that I found it's interesting when I go to Lansing. It's time to focus on outcomes and results. I've already set one of the guidelines um, for people that come visit me in Lansing. I said, if you walk in my office and the first words out of your mouth is, we need funding for this, I'm going to throw them out. Because too often that's the current culture in Lansing. It's about funding. It's all about funding this or funding that. We need to change the dialogue to outcomes and results to things that are measurable, that are meaningful, that make a difference in real people's lives. And hopefully you can see the tie back to accounting again, because that's what accountants are best at, are measuring things. And I'm going to diverge for a minute and mention one thing that helped me for the young people here about how you look at accounting, is because quite often we don't get a good rep in terms of saying you're taking an accounting class. The way I've always looked at accounting in terms of measuring and doing that as I've always described it as more a foreign language than anything. It's the language of business. If you want to be successful in business, this is the way we communicate in a common standard, through these numbers, through these formats, through this information. And we need to get that set up in our government and move away from the old broken system of just spending dollars and showing real results for real people. So that's something that critically needs to happen. As part of that, it's how we actually do the whole budget process. And you're going to hear a lot about this. Because traditionally in Michigan, to do a budget, 
It's been nine months. And we've actually shut down our government twice in the last four or five years because of how long it's taken to get a budget done. Well, how do we do the budget at the state? And how do we do it in most municipalities? It's a whole series of line items. It goes through all these lines about functions. It literally says, you're going to do this function and you're going to have this many people on a line item basis for a 40-some billion dollar budget. Now, in your business, if you're in a business, or even in your household, you would never operate that way. You wouldn't stay in business long. Or in your household, believe me, you'd have some interesting discussions over the table. So the whole format is, how do we get it to be based about outcomes and results? And focus on deliverables and saying, how do we measure that? And that's where we're going to move. And we're actually going to go do a two-year budget instead of just one year to squeeze out the inefficiencies, to make people understand this is not just kicking the can down the road for one more year. But it's about seriously looking at numbers over an extended period of time. So all those things will come together. And so one of my goals is to get a budget done in the first half of the year, a two-year budget. So you're going to see a whole different attitude and approach to that. And I view that as exciting. Um, and I'll come back and I call some of these things exciting. For a lot of people, they're going, budgets are not exciting. <laughs> it's that attitude of success, though, to say you can do something. And one thing I'll come back to about outcomes and results and all the things I've talked about about measuring. One of the big cultural things when I talked about us having a broken culture is I've seen it already in Lansing and other parts of the state. When you talk about measuring people, um, everyone likes change until it affects you. As soon as change comes to affecting a person, whether it be me or you or anyone else, it was a good idea until then. Um, we need to overcome that. The second theory that goes along with that is when you hear about being measured, too often in our state, what comes to mind when you talk about being measured? I will guess, and I will tell you from talking to lots of people, most people take it as, uh-oh, I could get in trouble. This could be a negative because I'm being measured. Well, again, that's that broken culture. Let's turn it to say we have a positive culture in this state and we're looking towards the future. Actually, measuring things is the best way to measure success. How do you know you've accomplished something? How do you know you've achieved something if you don't measure it? So one of the cultural things we need to do is change that setting to say it's not about trying to get someone in trouble. It's the very best way to celebrate success and to show we're winning. And I'll share a story to put it in perspective for you. I went to the National Governors Association. They had me off to governor's school. Um, went to a National Governors Association meeting. And in this room, there were 25 to 30 different governors and governors elect. And the sessions had all gone great. But they, then they said, we have a personalized folder for each state, for you on your desk. So OK, well, I've got a Michigan folder. So I opened my folder, and it's actually from Moody's, the bond rating agency. And they had lots of words, but up in the upper left-hand corner, there were two numbers that really just jumped off the page. Because they were, they were in black background. They were big white numbers. These were the highlights of the page, or the lowlights. But these were the numbers that jumped off the page. And what were they? They were the employment growth projections. They had employment growth from 2009 to 2011 was the top number. The second number was 2009 to 2014. And I'll give you the caveat, they actually had a denominator of 54. I think they were including Puerto Rico and some islands. So it wasn't 50, but again, it was there. So what were the two numbers I got to look at? And to put it in context, just the day before, I was in another session where publicly I had to listen to two governors argue about who were the top two states in the country. So I opened our, my folder, our folder, and the two numbers I got to see. The first number for 2009 to 2011 was 47. The number for the 2009 to 2014 number was 50. And I looked at that. And what came to mind? We were being measured. What came to mind to me is that this is a piece of fiction. 
This is now what's going to happen. We are going to beat the living daylights out of that number. Because that was someone's old estimate. And I can tell you, that document, that piece of paper, um, it's in my office. It's on my desk. I'd have it on the wall. I don't have any pins to put anything on the wall yet. <laughs> but I am going to leave that on my wall. And the first staff meeting I got back is I had copies made. And I passed that out to everyone we had already brought on our team and asking them to keep that. Because we're going to beat that. And again, that's a case of measurement. But I didn't view it as a negative. It's an opportunity to be positive. And so that's the approach we need to take with all of this. That's the approach that I built that career on that you heard about, about being a nerd getting through college by 23, about becoming a partner that quick, about building those other organizations, about being successful at being governor. Because I believe in measurement. I believe in getting the facts out. But I believe that gives you a benchmark to beat and bring that positive attitude and fire. And so that's why I'd sort of come back and summarize what this is to me in terms of the opportunity to talk with you and what the opportunity facing us is. is. You should be proud if you're studying accounting or tax. I am a proud CPA. I am a proud nerd. But beyond that, when people ask you what it's all about, the average person will not understand when, if you say you're an accountant. They'll say you're a numbers person. They'll say, you're a person that lives your life about numbers. That's not true. The reason I am in this profession is about people. It's about taking that language and applying it in a fashion to achieve success. And I go back and look at my career. And that's why I told you the story about VITA, that Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. I was doing numbers for someone. But I was doing numbers for an elderly person, multiple elderly people, that didn't have any money. And by doing those numbers, I was able to brighten their lives, to materially improve their lives for at least the holidays or some other period by making a difference to them. At HMI, at Health Media, the story I told you about, doing a business plan. It was about building a business plan where there's a brilliant researcher Vic Strecker is one of the brightest guys in the world in his field, but he needed a business partner, a numbers person to work with him to create that success. Because it's not one person, it's building the right team. By creating that team, we create an entity that now employs over a couple hundred people in our state and has made a difference in people's lives around the world. Now you come to the state of Michigan. I'm in, in an NGA conference, and they give me a folder that says, hey, you're the guy in charge of the state at the bottom. There are 10 million people in our state. There are over 2 million of those people on some kind of public assistance. Well, I'm proud to say I'm the governor-elect of the state, because the goal here is to change all those numbers, because they're not numbers. They're real people. So the focus here is, is how do you make unemployment go down so the person without a job has a job? That's why number one on their list is more and better jobs. It's to bring up the things we don't talk about enough, underemployment, the people that had the well-paying job that are now just getting by. Our per capita income in the state has dropped dramatically. It's how to create that opportunity for them to get on a positive path for income growth so they can do better and use the skills they were trained for rather than doing whatever they needed to do just to make ends meet. And it's about helping the people, whether they be in an urban area or a rural area, they have lost hope. They have been in difficult times for so long they're not sure they're going to have an opportunity in an employment future or a bright future. You start with the facts, you start with the numbers, but remember they're people. And that's the power we have. That is why there, I put out a clear positive vision. Put out a plan and have an attitude of action. But this isn't about me. 
I will close on something. It's about we. And this will be our great challenge, again, is the cultural one. This is not whether you're an urban person or rural person, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. The challenge I throw out to all of you is to put all those labels aside and come back to Michigander. It's by acting as Michiganders and realizing the benchmark we've been written off by many. It is time to set a high bar, a high bar of achievement in a positive way. And to say, we're stepping forward not to fight about that bar, but to solve the problems to get there. And that's the path we're on. I'm extremely excited. I am absolutely fired up. But I need you to get out there and spread that word to everyone you know and to be there because I will call on your help. The hardest work was not the election, nor the time now. The hardest work is still to come because we will face challenges. We will face those people that say, that was a great idea until you talked about affecting me. Or to face that challenge to say, I don't like to be measured because that means I could get in trouble. We need to turn that all around and have that positive attitude to say it's about being positive instead of negative. It's about looking towards the future instead of the past and about being inclusive instead of divisive. So thank you so much for the opportunity to give this lecture and to George Husband for his great work in the past and all the wonderful things he did with this institution because I'm excited to be here. This is the core to our future. Institutions, Wayne State, and the city of Detroit. So let's go make this happen. Thank you so much. It's my distinct honor to introduce the president of Wayne State University, Alan Gilmore. Thank you, Alan. Well, what did you think of that? <laughs> We're ready for action now, aren't we? We're all charged up. I guess we've got to wait till the first or the second or the third or whenever Rick is going to start. But he's ready to go and we're ready to go. Rick, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for all your support. Thank you for all your ideas. Thank you for laying out the course that this state is going to follow. One more thing, we have a plaque, so remember us. <laughs> I'll, I'll read the plaque, and it simply says, presented to Governor-elect Rick Snyder, CPA, 2010, 2011, Georgia, husband, distinguished lecturer, Wayne State University, Detroit, Michigan, December 9th, 2010. God bless you all, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you at future Georgia Husband Distinguished Lecturers. Thanks again.